War is indeed hell. The fog of war is the devil himself. It can wedge itself into your heart and mind, turn a good man bad. Many lives are lost to the fog of war. My name is Nathaniel Clark. My family and I set out to make a life for ourselves out here on the harsh and unyielding Texas frontier. Little did we know that we would know exactly what people mean when they say, war is hell. Well, I wrote the stage play in 2012. It wasn't actually my idea that we were planning this major commemoration of the Great Hanging because it was the anniversary and the curator of the museum, of the local museum, thought it would be a good idea if we allowed the characters to tell their own story. And I thought it sounded like great fun because as a historian, I don't get to play with the facts that much from time to time. So I thought it would be interesting to try to put myself in their perspective and imagine what was going on in 1862 and what their motives might have been, how the community might have reacted. Gainesville, Texas is a proud and patriotic community filled with good and hardworking people. Hospitality comes naturally here on the front porch of Texas. But, like many communities across the nation, the surface masks a dark and frightening past, one that must not be forgotten, lest we accidentally repeat it. This was not a war of two countries, but rather a war of brothers. Kinfolk, whom President Lincoln famously said, read the same Bible, and prayed to the same God. Even with my best efforts to keep him safe, my eldest son was amongst those fighting. James, there's no shame and fear. There's no glory and easy death. Are you ready? Yes, sir. The devil's knocking on our doors. Tell him we get off our asses and escort those Yankee bastards to the gates of hell. I'm with you, Captain. Go. The fog of war produces a shadow of chaos that, if left unchecked, will envelop and infect a community. Another thing I wanted to do with writing this, the script is I wanted, to, I wanted it to have implications beyond what happened in Gainesville in 1862. I wanted it to be sort of a morality play of what can go wrong and how things can escalate out of control so quickly. Meet Ephraim Childs, one of the leaders of the Peace Party and a Union man from Virginia. We meet in secret to discuss continued support to the opposition of secession. Gentlemen, the county voted against secession by 60%. Yet the slaveholders and men of influence will stop at nothing to see us join the Confederacy. Now I know some of your boys have been conscripted and I sympathize. All the more reason why we need to keep together the opposers of secession. If we do this, we might have a shot at gaining control. 
Let those damn slaveholders fight their own damn war. Yeah. What do you say, gentlemen? Are you with me? Yeah. I'm with you. Well, Nathaniel, are you with us? I was born and raised in Kentucky. I came to Cook County, Texas in 1857 with my wife and our children. I am a steadfast unionist, passionately disagrees with the Confederacy. Though I am no conspirator, I keep my mouth shut for my boy so as not to involve my family. I am a Quaker and a man of reason and I detest slavery, as it is a cruel instrument wielded by men who thirst for an ungodly power. Because of such notions, I am a pariah to some and a saint to others. I fear my life may be taken because of this, though I pose no threat to our community. As such, we have become a society where we oppress those who do not confer and align with the majority. There is no justice in such behavior. Well, Nathaniel, are you with us? Yeah, I'm with you. Little did I know that this attendance and decision would cost me my life. What happened is the Confederacy passed a draft act and other laws in early 1862. Now, how do you carry those out? Well, it was the decision of the military commander for the state of Texas that he imposed martial law. So he declared Texas under martial law in late May of 1862. Who carries out the martial law and makes sure that that's carried out in each county? Each county had a provo marshal appointed. That's Borland. Although I think Borland is afraid of the situation, I also think he's very determined to maintain his own power. And I think Borland saw himself as the hero in this scenario, that he will be the one who has brought to light this, this vicious conspiracy to sell the community out. So I see him as a man who's trying to make sure he can control the situation he feels is perhaps out of control. I think he's scared too. But of course, he doesn't come across in the script as being scared. He comes across as being a really almost mean person who's just got to control things. But I think that's because he's afraid. Meet James G. Borland, provost marshal of the county and overseer of the proceedings to come. He has been given word that there are union spies amongst them. Armed with this knowledge, he goes to seek counsel with Colonel William C. Young. My task is to keep the law and the peace within this county. Am I a bad man for doing that by whatever means necessary? I think not. My own spy gives me more than enough cause to begin to move against Childs and the peace party. All I need to do now is to get the support of my superior, Colonel William C. Young. William, good to see you, sir. The same. What is the cause for this meeting? Traitors in our community. Who? Old Childs and his peace party? Yes, sir. I believe them to be conspiring with the Union, carrying information to the North and possibly plotting an insurrection. Do you possess hard evidence of this? We have a spy in their midst. Yeah, what spy? Newton Chance. Uh, very well. I want names for issued warrants. You and your men will exercise them. Consider it done, sir. And James? You will remember to use a certain level of civility. You have my words. During the 1st of October, 1862, Borland and his men executed warrants against the known men of the Peace Party, including myself. I know this is difficult, but I need you to stay strong. I can't stay strong. I can't do this without you. I need you to take care of the children. They need you. We need you. Would you trust me, please? I need you to stay here. Okay? Please. Trust Daniel, me. Daniel, let's go. Come on. No. 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 No. Woman, you need to sit down no. and stay here. 
We were to be brought before a citizen's court in a community filled with citizens who voted against secession. One would think we would find justice, but the fog of war and fear reached a fever pitch. So Borland, under martial law, has almost blanket authority. He can boss around the sheriff. He can call up the um, commander of the militia and request assistance, but it's really more in the form of an order. He has very broad authority as long as the civilian law has been suspended and martial law is in place. Look, it is better that one innocent man die than one guilty man survive to tear us apart from within. We must maintain peace. I fear you are pushing towards a tragic conclusion. Sensibility and reason should rule here, not division and scare tactics. Because of your actions, we're facing a raucous mob. Do you suggest that we tuck tail and run like a scared dog afraid of its master? We must use our power and influence to convene a citizen's court. We'll stop the mob, get the people behind us, but in a civil manner. And who will serve as jewelry? I have a few in mind. Well-respected men who can appease a mob. Within a week, Borland and his men rounded up countless men to go before a citizen's court where their futures would be determined. But to do this, jurors were needed. Meet one such juror, Minister Thomas Barrett. For me, there are always two overriding factors in my decision-making. Facts and God's voice. I've received what are supposed to be the facts from Colonel Young. Now I will go to the court and await God's voice. This will allow me, during these proceedings, to be the voice of reason, as I fear I shall have to be. I saw him as a, a man of God, a man who believes in the Bible and the scriptures, who believes that his life is dictated by a strong moral compass. He sees all this bloodletting in a very definite moral context, in a moral lens, that if we, if we hang these people, if we kill these people with no more cause than this, we have to meet our maker and we have to explain it. This response is very unexpected. Yes. As you can see, your voice is very necessary. Well, just know, William, that I will not be swayed by provocation, and that I will make all determinations based on facts, law, and a little divine providence. That's why I want you on the jury. We need another voice of reason rising above the hot-headed nature of Borland and Chance. I'm sure Borland and Chance are doing you no favors in quelling that situation. Yes. Their rambunctiousness has only added more wood to the flame. Thomas, I thank you for doing me this courtesy. What I have stuck to my guns on is that the majority of those who were caught up in this and the majority of those who lost their lives were not hardcore unionists. They were not committed to saving one f government or another. They were simply men trying to feed their families and get along on a frontier and all the things that a young family or even a well-settled family might want to have and acquire. Um, they, their interest in the greater issues of nationalism and even slavery was not very clear at all. Does that mean there were no dedicated unionists? Absolutely not. I think there were several of them. In the beginning, men were being convicted on a simple majority. Soon, seven men were sentenced to death, including Childs. Get off me. Ephraim Childs. That would be I, your honor. You have been tried and convicted of treason against the Confederacy. Traitor. How say you? Hang him. You catamites will be damned. And you haven't got the sand! Get him out of here! here Many thought this would appease the mob and stop the rampant fear. However, this was not the case. The mob requested more blood and seven additional men who opposed secession but posed no threat to the community were sentenced to death. 
There is that famous moment after the first week or so of deliberations when they had convicted seven men on a majority vote. And Barrett is just horrified. And that's when he stands up, allegedly with at least one other man, and said, if y'all keep this up, we quit. First seven, and now seven more. Where will this end? I will concede that some of these men favored the Union, but most were just simple men wanting peace. If we try to save these men, it may be our necks that hang from the end of that rope. And that's when Montague and others said, okay, let's talk about this. And they switched to the two-thirds vote. And Barrett very proudly notes in his memoirs, after the two-thirds vote was adopted, that jury never again convicted any man to hang in Gainesville. Fourteen lives to save hundreds. That was the mantra between the prosecutor and the jury members. This is Bob Scott, a participant in these proceedings, but for a much different purpose. Folks, let me tell you something. Them was some shown sure enough scary times. <laughs> the master Rufus Scott was all fighting them blue coats up north. And of course that left me to oversee the homestead till his return. That's when Borland and his men come around. They demanded the use of Master Scott's wagon. So I told them where it was. But as they rode off to collect it, they felt mighty uneasy. Bob Scott was probably the most difficult character for me to write because we have such little of the historical Bob Scott to go on. But I tried to imagine how the slave himself would have felt. I imagined that he was frightened. Everyone was frightened. It would be most unusual if he weren't afraid. Certainly there was that racial tension in the community. Even though there's not a huge slave population in Gainesville, that certainly in the broader context of the war, what this is all about. He's also certainly, being, having been all of his life a slave, knows that this is a system maintained by violence. If the slaves show any signs of resistance, if they show any signs of being a danger to the white community, they'll be the ones at the end of that hanging rope. Bob, what are you doing? We don't need to be getting involved in this mess. Look, a lot of talk going on about abolition. <laughs> but with everything else going on around here, if we ain't careful, us black folk bound to get some of the blame. But now, if I drive that wagon, maybe, just maybe, Bowling and the mothers won't pay us no mind. Let's go on over here and we'll have to talk with them. Yeah, the whole system or the process of being hanged is macabrely fascinating, I suppose. Obviously, you have time to reflect on what's going to happen to you. You are going to be allowed to write out a last statement or will and testament. Uh, Alexander Boutwell as sheriff and others will witness it for you, their last kindness, I suppose. You will be then loaded into the back of a wagon and that wagon will be driven up California Street by Bob Scott. I drove them right to their deaths. And Lord, they was horrible deaths of a kind no man or woman should ever have to endure. But a kind of death my people know all too well. Those of us being held were excited that we would eventually get to return to our homes. However, that all changed the day Colonel Young was assassinated. The effect of Young's death on the trials was very clear. Those in charge of the trials obviously assumed that Young's death was connected to the conspiracy that they were fighting by holding the trials in the first place. So therefore, logically to them, the men locked up in the store, while they were not the men who shot Young, they were co-conspirators. So when the court came back together 
the jury was reconstituted with a few new people and they actually went back through the transcripts and started retrying men who had been told you'll be released. As Young tried to unfold the murder of James Dixon, he too fell victim to a bully. Men who had defected and fled the Confederate Army shot and killed Young because they feared he would have them court-martialed. They inadvertently incited the mob that believed that allies of the Union spies had murdered both Dixon and Young in retaliation. With Young dead, there was no measure of control over Borland. And as such, chaos ruled. Clark was definitely among those men who had been either tried and dismissed or had simply been not even brought before William C. Young's court because he was obviously not implicated. We'll never really know. But he is definitely among those men who were told, just be patient, wait a week, we'll let you go. And now you can't imagine how earth shattering it must have been to be told, we lied. Um, you're among the 19 that are going to be hanged tomorrow. Nathaniel Clark, step forward. Traitor. Nathaniel, the evidence set against you is conspiracy with intent to convey messages with the Union. This conviction carries the penalty of death. To hell with you, Borland. Why would I conspire with the Union now that my son fights for the Confederacy? I don't rightly know, Nathaniel. That's just something you'll have to discuss with St. Peter when you see him shortly. You son of a bitch. Take him away! I'm innocent! Come on! Get your, get your goddamn hands off of me! You know I'm innocent. A cold wind of despair runs over me as I reluctantly take my place in the wagon. It's a car. No, you get in the back of this goddamn wagon or I'll shoot you dead right here and then I'll pay a visit to your family. My son is fighting for your ill advised cause. So why would I do anything to put him or his men in harm's way? I don't know, and I don't care. Now you just get in the back of the goddamn wagon. Bob, sit your ass down and get this wagon moving now. My only thought now is of my family. I think of my wife and our lives together. I think of my children, my boy James, who even now fights for the very people that are murdering his father. My son, peace washes over me. I pray to the Almighty that you are well and that you will not meet me here shortly on the other side. Ms. Clark, please heed what I say next. When we get to the end, the men gonna make you stand up in this wagon and they gonna place a rope around your neck. Then they, they gonna command me to drive off. Ms. Clark, <laughs> I'm pleading with you, please. Don't let this wagon slide from under your feet. Just make it quick and lunge from the back. Don't give them the satisfaction of seeing you suffer. Thank you, Mr. Scott. You're a good man. Thank you, sir. Likewise. Mr. Scott, could you deliver a letter for me? A letter, sir? See, I feared this. Outcome over the past in two days, and in preparation, I wrote to my wife and children. Could you see that they get it? Miss Clark, I'm going to lean forward a little bit. You slide that letter right behind me. And I'll make sure it gets to your family. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Yes. If you are well, 
you will hear of your father's murder. But I pray you stay steadfast and just. Do not seek vengeance, for vengeance is folly. Brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor, a nation divided. Prepare yourself to live and die. I hope to meet you in a better world. God bless you all. Fresh from the chaos of battle, I would receive a letter from my mother. It told me of the horrors that befell my father and so many others. That was the last time I wore a gray coat. I would join the Union Army, not for vengeance, but for the sake of justice. I thank you all for listening. We must not be afraid of our past or our history. We must learn from it. For if we do not, we are doomed to repeat it. Unfortunately, today's culture is very existential. We live in the moment. What happened yesterday does not matter. What happens tomorrow I cannot control, therefore I will not think about it. It's people wanting to live within their comfort zone or they have a goal that is in opposition to the truth that you want to bring them, and so they prefer not to hear you. I think we can only really deal with the present when we can come to grips with our past. I did not intend the script in any way to dismerge the character of those whose ancestors were involved in this. I don't think they were bad people. I don't think they did it because they were evil. I think they were scared people. And that's one of the uses of history is that it tells our story. It's the narrative about, about who we are as a people. If we can't get past that, then we're never going to come to grips with what's going on in the present. <laughs>